I like archetypes. The damsel in distress, she cries every night. Mentors give advice. The fire and the ice, yeah, they battle every night. All right, welcome to the lecture on archetypes, which are models of our entertainment and philosophies. If you don't know what archetypes are, then when I give you my lecture here, you will probably realize that you did know what archetypes are because we see them all the time. So what is the definition of an archetype? Well, an archetype comes from the Greek word meaning original pattern or model. And so in literature and art, an archetype is going to be like a character, an event, a story, or an image that recurs in different works, in different cultures, and in different periods of time. So even though um, a storyline has happened decades or centuries ago, it's still going to have the same effect for the audience. So can you think of any stories or image patterns that have been repeated in movies and books or even commercials? One example I have is from Cinderella. So we have several different versions of Cinderella besides the Disney version. We have the cartoon Disney version, then we've got the real live Disney version, and then we've got the Grimm's Brothers story of Cinderella. That's a different version, but if we're going to get into films, we've got the Hilary Duff movie called Another Cinderella Story. We've got a Selena Gomez film that's a Cinderella story and so forth. And so you see directors take these same situations and they make a pattern or a model out of them and they use them over and over again. So for example, Dirty Dancing, you've got the the rich girl and then you've got the poor boy that falls in love with her. So that's what we call the Dirty Dancing scenario. Same thing happens in Aladdin. Same thing happens in the movie Step Up with Channing Tatum. So you can kind of think about these patterns we see over and over again. So when you're trying to find an archetype, how, what, what's going to signal that it is an archetype? Well, first, it's going to be a shared idea with all of humanity. So regardless of where you live in this world, it's going to be a shared idea that we can all relate to. Next is an inherited part of the human being that connects us all. So for some reason, you feel connected to a character. This is exactly why when we watch TV shows, we feel that we are friends with those characters. Like, for example, I basically work at Gray Sloan Memorial Hospital on Gray's Anatomy because I feel so connected to those characters. So that's going to be the inherited part of the human being that connects us all. So those are going to be some of the archetypes that they use throughout that TV show. Next, a constant or universal idea, which kind of sounds like a theme. That's a universal idea or concept. So yes, archetypes are found in themes, and those are going to be patterns we see over and over again, the themes are. And though it may differ from place to place, the concept is worldwide. So just because it's in a different language doesn't mean the archetypal setting or situation or symbol is different. It's going to mean the same thing. The concept is worldwide. So today we're going to talk about the four different types of archetypes. First is situational. Second is symbolic. Third is setting, and then fourth is character. And so you'll often find several of these archetypes within one work. And here are specific examples of each type of archetype. So the movie opens, and the young, beautiful actress is on a tirade about how much she hates, and she means hates, detests, loathes, and every other adjective in between the new guy she works with, who happens to be drop dead good looking and single. He pokes fun at her and frequently stops by her desk. She fumes silently. She yells at him about how she can't stand the sight of him. He laughs and says he can't stand her either. What's going to happen? Well, yeah, you probably said they're going to fall in love. Well, yeah, well, how do you know that? Because that is what always happens. That is probably the basic plot formula for any kind of Hallmark movie. Also, you've got your Nicholas Sparks movies that use that. Any rom-coms, we call those romantic comedy films, those are going to have that situation in there where, a, you know, a boy and a girl don't get along in the beginning of a film, and then we know by the end they're going to be in love. All right, so situational archetypes, what's the definition? Well, this is going to be a given experience that a hero or character has to endure to move from one place in life to the next, so it's a situation. 
So think about what a situation means. It's a experience that someone has to endure. Um, so this is going to be an experience that we see over and over again. And it's actions and events that add to the plot and a common event seen throughout stories in many different genres. So if you're taking notes, I would just put situational archetypes equal given experience to help move on to the next place in life or plot that we see over and over again. So some situational archetypes include the following. We have the task, the quest, the initiation, the journey, the fall, death and rebirth, nature versus the mechanistic world, good versus evil, the unhealable wound, which is kind of what Peter Parker has in Spider-Man. It's that, that void, that that terrible feeling he has that he can't get rid of from his uncle passing. Um, and then we've got the ritual. So let's talk about the journey as a situational archetype. So it's pretty popular. So the hero is going to go in search of some truth or information to restore life to the kingdom. So this quest usually involves proving himself or defending or saving someone something or finding something. And a lot of times I may have students say, well, they didn't actually get a concrete object. Well, yeah, it, sometimes it could be information. Maybe it's power they're looking for. So you have to think about what the hero is on the journey to obtain. And there are several different types of journeys a hero can take. So maybe they're searching for identity of some sort. They're searching for knowledge or vengeance. Maybe they're looking to find the promised land like Katniss Everdeen is looking in the Hunger Games is looking for something better than what her district has, the promised land. It's the place for freedom and equality. Um, and then lastly, the journey for the grail, which is human perfection. You see that a lot in Indiana Jones. Um, so basically the type of journey determines the type of hero. Next is the fall. This is very popular too. This is basically when a character is going to go from a higher state of being to a lower state of being. And it usually involves a defilement and or a loss of innocence and bliss. So the fall is often accompanied by expulsion from a kind of paradise as a penalty for disobedience and moral transgression. So Think about Mean Girls where Katie, she like reaches this ultimate high state of being as being a plastic. She hurts everybody's feelings, including using the burn book, etc. And then she ultimately progresses to a lower state of being after everybody is so upset with her. And so that's what we would describe as the fall in a film or a novel or a TV series. Um, and then next we have the battle between good and evil. So if you're stuck on trying to find a situational archetype, more than likely you are going to find the battle between good and evil. This is a very standard, easy, go-to situational archetype for stories. And so this is going to be the battle between two primal forces. You've got classic conflicts with menacing enemies, natural danger, dangers, moral dilemmas, problems with society, and difficulty with fate or decisions. So, you know, you just jot a few of those situational archetypes down. Now we're going to move on to symbolic archetypes. So the movie opens on a dark, stormy night. There is no power in the house where the couple lives. Da -da -da -da. What does this suggest? Well, you're probably thinking that something terrible is about to happen to the couple, and you are probably right. And how do you know this? Why do you know this? It's because we see the symbol of a storm and rain, and then the lights go off and creates darkness. It creates that scary, eerie mood that we see in horror films and stories and TV series. And so that is how you know the couple is probably in danger. So symbolic archetypes are symbols such as a thunderstorm or darkness that represent something else. Um, these have occurred over and over again throughout time and, is, and in various different cultures. So if you're writing this down, I would probably put symbolic archetypes equal um, symbols we see over and over again that represent something else. So for example, the, an apple in a story can represent temptation or fairness, like you think Snow White, um, 
you know, she ate the poisonous apple. In Greek mythology, you've got the judgment of Paris where um, there's a party and a goddess, the, the goddess of discord, her name is Eris, E-R-I-S. She is not invited to the party, so she gets mad and takes an apple and throws it into the party. And on the apple, it says to the fairest of them all. And that's problematic when you've got a room full of goddesses who are all beautiful and headstrong. They're obviously all going to flock to the apple and think it's for them. So we have these symbols throughout stories that represent you know, different ideas, but it's the same symbol we see over and over again, such as a storm, such as an apple, such as darkness. So some examples of symbolic archetypes. We're going to have light versus darkness. And so, you know, I do love Star Wars, but it is obvious in Star Wars of the symbolic archetypes here because we do have light versus darkness. We've got the light side versus the dark side. So the light is going to suggest hope, renewal, or intellectual illumination. And then darkness here is going to suggest the unknown, ignorance, despair. It can also represent evil. Next is heaven versus hell. This is going to be where gods live in the skies or mountaintops and, you know, evil forces the character to live in the bowels of the earth. Or maybe um, the villain lives in the bowels of the earth. We see this in a lot of our Greek mythology stories. Um, we've got Mount Olympus where the where Zeus lives and the Olympians meet. And then we've got the underworld, which is where the dead reside. Next is water for cleansing. So I said, if you don't learn anything in my class this semester, please know that water is for cleansing. Um, it offers a character an opportunity to purify himself from a wrong. So this is why a lot of times at the end of films, a character may be submerged under water. It may be raining, a character falls in a puddle, you name it. There's probably water somewhere, and that means that a character is being cleansed and renewed, and they are undone from their wrongdoing. Now, sometimes it can have the opposite effect. So when we think of like maybe like another liquid, it may not be for cleansing. So, for example, in Suicide Squad, we have Harley Quinn who is dunked into a tank of toxic liquid, and then she comes out very different and very evil and very obsessed with the Joker, her partner, who basically owns her based off of her garb, um, her dress. And so here, that has a different effect. So you have to look at what the character is being um, cleansed with, so to speak. Um, next, we have numbers. Like, for example, three is important in the Christian faith, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Um, animals, animals such as snakes or cows are going to hold a special value in culture or religion. Um, doves may symbolize peace. Crows may symbolize trouble. Um, in the Game of Thrones series, a crow can be a prophet and see into the future. Um, you know, snakes can represent evil in stories. Think about in the book of Genesis, we've got the Garden of Eden and temptation. So, Really, when you see an animal, you need to kind of question to yourself, why is that animal there? What does that animal represent? The next kind of ar archetypes we're going to talk about are setting archetypes. So setting archetypes equal settings we see over and over again throughout literature. And although they may vary a little bit as culture changes and society changes and gets updated, the idea and concept is going to stay the same. So some of these examples would include like a universe of opposites. So this is going to be anything from like light to dark, day and night, good and evil, or man versus beast. Um, the underworld for afterlife is another example. This is going to be any form of going under to achieve some kind of enlightenment or to be tested. Now, in Greek mythology, we, there are two characters who have made it into the underworld and made it out alive one being Hercules and the other one being Odysseus from Homer's The Odyssey. So they literally have to go into the underworld to, ach to achieve some information and gain that in order to continue on their journey. Now, sometimes they can go into the bowels of the earth. Um, think about a basement or a cave. Think about the movie The Goonies where they have to go into a cave and they are looking for treasure. Next is the paradise setting or a lost paradise setting. So this is going to be anything that 
you know, is an untouched area by man, a land, um, like got the Garden of Eden. This could be your island in Madagascar. This could be Pirates of the Caribbean. This could be Castaway. Um, that's just going to be a lost paradise setting. Next is the landscape that emerges from chaos. It begins with some kind of void or confusion and something whole is brought forth, such as the light and darkness and can emerge from a watery chaos. So you see that in a lot of your sci-fi post-apocalyptic films. Next is a river or water source. Um, again, this is an emphasis on water being an element of cleansing properties and life-giving and renewal. So this would be like a river, an ocean, a swimming pool, even a bathtub or a water puddle. So any kind of water source you have here or it could be like a leak somewhere and a character, like a like a water tank breaks open and a character is like drenched in water all of a sudden. You have to pay attention to different water elements in films. And then lastly here we have the communal hall, which is going to be a place of brotherhood and loyalty. Um, when you think about a meal that characters sit down and have together, it's more than just a meal. It's like an act of communion. This is where people eat and gather and talk and hang out and so this is where celebrations would occur this is where major decisions would be made as well and then another setting archetype that i don't have listed on here that is that we see a lot is going to be like the evil or uncharted forest so if you're into fairy tales or disney movies you probably have one of those forests that the character should not go into Next is character archetypes. So this is going to be a person or being that serves as a representative of a greater ideal. So these are going to be characters that we see over and over again. Um, and these are just, to just name a few, these examples. This does not say that these are all the character archetypes that are out there because these are definitely not. There are so many. But first we've got the unfaithful Y for the temptress. The temptress would be like, Medusa in Percy Jackson. Um, it's going to be the female that leaves, leads the hero off of his path. Next is star-crossed lovers. We see this in Romeo and Juliet and The Fault in Our Stars. Damsel, damsel in Distress. That is the female who needs rescuing. Princess Leia in Episode 4 of Star Wars is the damsel in distress. Next is the scapegoat. This is the character that takes all the blame, even if they didn't do what they're being accused of. Next, the devil figure. This is your evil character. Um, it can also be your villain. Then you have the creature of nightmares, which is like the creature that surfaces um, from your worst fears. You have the friendly beast next. So this would be like Sully from Monsters, Inc. Um, the friendly beast could even be, um, you know, the character from the Goonies. We think he's like a monster and a beast, but he turns out to be kind of friendly. And then we have the hero, which we have talked about extensively, and the mentor, the guide for the hero. A young man from the provinces. This is going to be um, Aladdin. This is like your young boy from the, sh the streets. Um, this is going to be Noah from the notebook. Next, the initiates. This is going to be the group that has to initiate in order to be accepted. Hunting Group of Companions is next. I think of the Lost Boys on Peter Pan. Also, the Hunger Games, you have the Hunting Group of Companions. The Loyal Retainers are also known as the Sidekicks. So, you would have Timon and Pumbaa and the Lion King. They are the Loyal Retainers and the Sidekicks. The Outcast, this is often your hero, too. So, character archetype can be applied. Uh, multiple character archetypes can be applied to one character. The evil figure with ultimately the good heart. This is going to be Snape in Harry Potter. This is going to be Vivian from Legally Blonde. Um, it's going to be that character that you thought was bad in the beginning, but they end up helping the character out in the end. And then lastly, we have the Earth Mother who helps the character along their journey and gives them advice. So this would be like the willow tree in Pocahontas. So let's look at an example from archetypes and apply them to our favorite ogre, Shrek. 
All right, so here we have the hero. It is Shrek because he is literally doing superhuman deeds. His quest is to find and rescue Princess Fiona. His task is to get his swamp back from fairy creatures. Light versus darkness. So if you look in this scene, the castle is dark to represent evil. Fiona is first seen in a ray of light as soon as they escape. They emerge into daytime since they have escaped evil. Here, a moment of death and rebirth occur when they escape the dragon. Morning is dawning, suggesting hope and rebirth. So anytime you have a sunrise, that's new new beginning, new times. Starcross lovers, dragons and donkeys aren't supposed to be together, and neither are prin ogres or princesses. Evil figure with a good heart, that's going to be the dragon. Uh, the journey, Shrek and donkey face their fears and conquer the dragon finding fiona to accomplish their task so in conclusion archetypes are everywhere but you know we just often overlook them they can be found in every book short story tv show or movie um, archetypes represent ideas that are larger than themselves and so this concludes the lecture on archetypes i hope you begin identifying archetypes when you watch movies, TV series, and you read your books.